would like to look at other things in connection with the, the beast of the revelation that persecutes the saints and uh, how we interpret this book and how we understand it. Um, want to expand some on the theme of the animal and the animalistic um, nature and behavior of the beast in the Revelation, as well as the, um, I guess, the prefigures of these things in, in uh, the Old. So one of the things that you start to see emerging from the scriptures when you start looking for things that are like Daniel speaking of an animal and or, or these kind of animalistic behaviors. Um, you find that Satan is actually described this way fairly often and <clears throat> the embodiment of it is very often this idea of us being hunted down. Um, a persecution, if you will, is something like uh, hunting, chasing, like chasing a fox. Um, and this is the way that it's described sometimes in Scripture. And Psalm 59 is the first example where, you know, the animal-like description would be something like stalking prey. So that we're saying the faithful are being treated this way by Satan. They're being stalked um, <clears throat> like an animal, like a, a, an, you know, like a prey. They're being watched, if you will, by something more powerful than them in order to overcome them. So you have Psalm 59. And it's uh, the first five verses here, but this is this has got a header that says that David penned this when Saul sent men to watch his house in order to kill him. It was saying to us, as you may recall, that Saul was the first king of Israel, but he was deposed because he did not remain faithful to God, did not fulfill the commandments of God. And... Uh, when he was deposed, the Lord caused David to be anointed his king. So David was the anointed king of the Lord while Saul still sat on the throne and refused to release it and brought force to bear. And this is one such time when he sent soldiers to watch David's house in order to kill him, which is very much in keeping with this idea of prey, and it says um, there in verse 1, Deliver me from my enemies, my God. Protect me from those who rise up against me. Deliver me from those who work evil. Save me from bloodthirsty men. And it's true. That's definitely something that came to bear against David, though he was not in any way uh, usurping the throne or, or overthrowing authority or right order. He was just God's choice for the king. And if Saul had feared the Lord, he would have stepped down and allowed the Lord's choice to reign. But he did not. And as a result, the enemies of David have risen against him. They are bloodthirsty and working evil. And David realizes that he relies on God to be delivered from this. And that is good for us as well. We also ought to realize that Satan has more power than we do and can bring more power to bear than we are able to withstand. We rely on God for strength and for deliverance. The fact is we are fairly vulnerable the way that prey animals are vulnerable to the predator. And in verse 2, I'm sorry, verse 3, he says, Behold, they lie in wait for my life. Fierce men stir up strife against me. For no transgression or sin of mine, O Lord, for no fault of mine, they run and make ready. Awake, come to meet me and see. You, Lord God of hosts, are God of Israel. But again, it's for no transgression or sin of David's. He didn't, he had no fault, no reason why 
they should be attacking him, why they should lie in wait for his life. And he says, Rouse yourself, Lord, to punish all the nations. Spare none of those who treacherously plot evil. So this one, this David, in faith, is relying on God to protect him. He's outmanned, he's overpowered, if he relies on his own strength, but he does not. He relies on the strength that God provides. And in this, he is more than conqueror. As he does continue in safety. And in fact, Saul is delivered into his hand multiple times, and he refuses to kill Saul. But that idea that he was being hunted down, that, that there was this re- genuine threat that well overpowered him, and is kind of a terrifying thing to, to contemplate, he really could have died. But that's not what happened. Then I would go to Lamentations. Lamentations. <clears throat> and the third chapter. Because I found there also imagery of, you know, the working of Satan in this world as a hunter, as you know, one who is pursuing the the people of God. And it says there in Lamentations 3, verses 52 down to 54, I've been hunted like a bird by those who were my enemies without cause. They flung me alive into the pit and cast stones on me. Water closed over my head. I said, I am lost. Um, And these verses, I think, are all of them important, but that 52nd verse especially is the one that is clearly related, in imagery at least, to what we read um, to what we read earlier in uh, Psalm 59 about David being hunted down, stalked like prey. Here in the Lamentations, regarding the destruction of Jerusalem from the perspective of even faithful who stayed there, uh, who were left, the poorest in the land who were left. He says, I've been hunted like a bird by those who were my enemies without cause. And remember David had said it was for no fault of his, no transgression. There was not cause for this. But it's also interesting to me, I think those other verses are also important. They flung me alive into the pit and cast stones on me. That is very much imagery of death and resurrection. The stone could not keep the seal on the tomb when Jesus was raised from the dead. And he certainly was pursued by the enemies of God. He certainly was destroyed in satanic activity. It was our sins that caused him to die. It was our uh, looking the other way or being cruel, unwittingly, albeit, but that's what happened. And that was certainly satanic, the way that we acted that caused his death. And for him to say in the 54th verse of Lamentations 3, water closed over my head. I said, I am lost. You know, this, this speaks of uh, the figure of water as the world or as an overwhelming of evil. But it also uh, refers back to Jonah, who also was overcome by the water, but was, if you will, in in a way of speaking, resurrected on the third day, being, you know, forcefully ejected, removed from that would-be tomb, to go into the city and to preach a message of salvation that was actually received in his case. (laughs) But it's very much the same image. So the way that Jesus was treated was to be hunted like an animal. The way that the people um, who were faithful, who were stuck in that town, were treated was to be hunted. And also in Lamentations, in chapter 4, 
there's again there's a lot of imagery that's refers to animals and animal behavior but the 18th verse said they dogged our steps so that we could not walk in our streets our end drew near our days were numbered our end had come and that being hunted like an animal they dogged our steps you know we we weren't safe walking in the streets anymore our own streets in our own town we weren't safe they were there tracking us And the 19th verse continues, Our pursuers were swifter than the eagles in the heavens. They chased us on the mountains. They lay in wait for us in the wilderness. And you know, the eagle is a hunter, a hunter like no other. It's very fast. Certainly from the perspective of a rodent in the grass, (laughs) you never see it coming. It's incredibly fast. They chased us on the mountains. They lay, wait for, lay in wait for us in the wilderness. You see this idea that we are effectively tiny and helpless. And so, again, it's telling us we rely on God to deliver. And there were some who were faithful, who stayed in the land, at least until they got carried away by their unfaithful rulers. And uh, exploring the ironies of that is beyond the scope of this lesson. <laughs> But uh, God does deliver his children. He does deliver the faithful. And the way to do this is to rely on him, to recognize our position relative to Satan. And what we're getting at is that, yeah, those who trust in God, those who uh, you know, make God their strength, will in fact overcome They will be victorious. That's the promise in Jesus, and that's why we do what we do, why we endure as we do. And uh, in the Revelation, back there in the 14th chapter, referring to the way that the beast went around, um, you know, I guess through his weight around, causing people to worship him, causing people to get a mark that would be their ticket to being able to trade freely or not be killed, you know, whatever else, you know, he uses his authority to impose evil. And this, of course, puts pressure on the saints. But it's also recorded for us there in Revelation 14, beginning down down at verse 9. If anyone worships the beast at its image and receives a mark on his forehead or on his hand. He also will drink the wine of God's wrath, pulled full strength into the cup of his anger, and he will be tormented with fire and sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever. They have no rest, day or night, these worshipers of the beast and its image, And whoever receives the mark of its name. Here is a call for the endurance of the saints, verse 12. Those who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus. This is the call to endurance, which is very similar to what we read back in 1310 of Revelation. Here is a call for the endurance and faith of the saints. When he said something terrible is about to take place, you know, when it comes to the persecution of the saints, that could be captivity, it could be death. We know that their property was plundered in Hebrews, uh, for example, in Hebrews 10. But uh, in the verses leading up to this here, Revelation 14, 9 through 12, especially, you're looking at uh, verses 10 and 11 that to compromise with sin, to worship the beast, to receive the mark so as to be able to buy and sell freely, you know, not be questioned, not be mistreated, not be pressured, you know, giving in for that relief uh, results, you know, in the wine of God's wrath. And it says he'll be tormented with fire and sulfur 
in the presence of the angels and, and of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever. They have no rest day or night, worshipers of the beast and its image, whoever receives the mark of its name. And that is the call for endurance, which is to say, it's not worth it. That's all it's getting at is that's not worth it. Eternity is too long. Hell is too hot. Eternity is too long. The torment uh, of, that is a spiritual torment that lasts forever and ever is not worth it. That, that price is too high for having peace in my time, for getting along here and having people be okay with you in a large audience. That's just not important from the perspective of eternity. And this is a call for endurance. Now, the other thing that you find coming to bear in Revelation 15 is this theme that the saints overcome, that the saints are victorious. And there is a sign in heaven, <clears throat> which in the second verse and the third verse says, I saw what happened or what appeared to be a sea of glass mingled with fire and also those who had conquered the beast and its image and the number of its name, standing beside the sea of glass with harps of God in their hands. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb. The sea of glass. Hmm. Well, what's the point of the sea of glass? Well, glass is still not wavy. <laughs> Those who conquered the beast and its image and the number of its name, which are the same thing, were standing next to this, this still sea, making music. And the song is the song of Moses, which we look at forthwith in Exodus 15 is where this happens. If you weren't familiar with the Song of Moses, I think that it's important to look at this, and it's important, I think, to understand the revelation this way. Why he's saying there is a glassy sea, and they're standing next to it making music, singing the Song of the Lamb, is that he's taking us back to the scene of Exodus 15, which is the children of Israel have walked through the Red Sea as on dry land. And the army of Egypt followed them into the Red Sea. But the children of Israel walked up on shore unharmed while God drowned the entire Egyptian army in the sea. And they washed up on the seashore while the sea became very still. And the people, you know, joined in this song, the song of Moses. It's their victory over the world. It's their victory over Egypt, a power far greater than they were. The, Egypt was the greatest world power, and they were sending their armed force against um, an entire people young and old, able-bodied and otherwise, who were just on foot. They stood no chance to overcome that army, but God delivered them. So this is also the same figure where we're well overpowered by the power of Satan, but God is well able to overcome it. When we are with him, we also will overcome and just as they stood by a still sea, victorious over the greatest army on earth, free from slavery and forced labor and harshness to worship the Lord their God, that's the picture that Revelation is tapping into. And the Song of Moses said, I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. A horse and a rider he has thrown into the sea. 
And this imagery is picked up in the Revelation. If you're reading it and you're looking at some of those battle scenes and things, yeah, it's true. The world brings this power to bear. The sat Satan brings this power to bear through the world. But God triumphs gloriously. If you skip down, for example, to the 11th verse of Exodus 15 of the Song of Moses here, they said, Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glorious deeds, doing wonders? Yeah, there is nobody like God. And so we have to remember, there's nobody like God. <laughs> There is nothing like the Bible, the truth that God reveals in it, the things that he caused to happen, and what we're seeing in the Revelation, I think very importantly, that this theme echoes throughout all of Scripture, throughout all of history, across their every situation and setting, um, across, you know, wherever they were in geography or in time, the same theme repeats itself. It comes again and again. And the point of that is that man didn't do this. God did this. Man couldn't possibly have done this. Who is like you, Lord, among the gods? Nobody could have caused this book to be written and have it be what it is. This incredible echo chamber from beginning to end <laughs> that resonates in the book of Revelation. It's not even possible. Man couldn't have done it. It couldn't possibly be coordinated. But do you remember if you read Revelation 13 about the beast? <clears throat> do you remember that it was described there in Revelation 13 verse 4 saying they worshiped the beast and they said while they were worshiping, who is like the beast? Who can fight against it? Well, the answer to that is Exodus 15, 11. Who is like you, Lord? Majestic in holiness, awesome in glorious deeds, doing wonders. Yeah, nobody is like God. Who is like the beast? That's the devil pretending to be God, as he always does. He imitates God. He always pretends like he has the authority of God. He told Jesus, all this has been given to me, and I give it to whom I will. Eh, wrong. <laughs> That's just a lie. That's just a lie. No, nobody is like God. And also, in the 17th and 18th verses of the Song of Moses, he said, You will bring them in and plant them on your own mountain, the place, O Lord, which you have made for your dwelling, the sanctuary, Lord, which your hands have established. The Lord will reign forever and ever. Yes, God brings them in and plants them on the mountain of his choosing. The mountain of the Lord, right? The city on the mountain, the bride that we have studied before in earlier lessons on the Revelation. It's the church. Here is where we are brought in when we obey by simple trusting faith, putting Jesus on in baptism for forgiveness of sins. And he adds to the number those who are being saved. That's how we're brought in. That's how we're planted. And we're planted into something that is not of human construction. We're planted in God's mountain. The place that he abides, meaning where he lives, where he dwells. It's the dwelling place of God, which is with men. It's the church. Oops. The sanctuary, which his hands have established. Hmm, that language is familiar, isn't it? Are we looking for a tabernacle not made with human hands? A city whose foundations are in heaven? Right? Who's, yes, whose builder is God, right? The Lord will reign forever and ever. And you know, we'll reign with him. The fact is that 
as they were baptized into Moses in the cloud and the sea, we are baptized into Christ Jesus in water. You know, as he said, you must be born again of water and of spirit. And we enter into a blessedness, which is life in Christ. Remember that last verse of, uh, that we looked at there in the Song of Moses is that God brings them into the sanctuary which his hands established, Exodus 15, 18. This life is in Christ Jesus according to the book of Revelation. See, this is not my thread. You know, it's not my narrative. I didn't come up with the bullet points for my sermon and then look for verses that fit it. I let the revelation dictate what the, ver what the bullet points are, and these are they. <laughs> revelation 15, verse 5 said, After this I looked, and behold, the sanctuary of the tent of witness in heaven was opened. Now at this point, he's talking about judgments coming forth on the world, but the fact is, he just finished in Revelation 15, with the song of Moses that began at verse 3. Great and amazing are your deeds, Lord God the Almighty. Just and true are your ways, King of the nations. Who will not fear, Lord, and glorify your name? You alone are holy. All nations will come and worship you. Your righteous acts have been revealed. After which I looked, and the sanctuary of the tent of witness in heaven was open. So don't forget that the immediate context is God overcomes, and his saints are standing on, the, on the, the seashore with their enemies washed up. That's where this is coming from. When was the sanctuary of the tent of witness opened up? When Jesus died on the cross, right? Right? When was the sanctuary opened up? It was when Jesus died. In Mark 15, for example, in this record of his crucifixion, we look at verses 37 and 38. Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The holiest of holies, that sanctuary, that inner, is covered by a curtain. But when Jesus died, the moment that Jesus died on the cross, that curtain was ripped in half from top to bottom. The way into the holiest of holies is inaugurated by the blood of Jesus, who enters into the holiest places, not um, the shadow and the copy of those things, the earthly tabernacle, but the real heavenly things in the spiritual places. But as a symbol of this, the curtain on earth was torn in two from top to bottom. And this is also what we're told in Hebrews chapter 10, Verses 19 to 23. He says, Brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and the living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And to go back over this one more time in closing, the fact is, we have a new and living way in Christ Jesus. When you are a Christian, you are more than conquerors through him who loves you, God and his son, Jesus Christ. 
in Christ, in the offering that he makes, in his blood, we have a new and a living way through the curtain that is his flesh. That's what we're talking about is that reference back in Mark 15 when Jesus gave up his body as a sacrifice, as the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. His flesh is the curtain, you know, allegorically speaking. And the destruction of his flesh, if you will, in his death is the tearing of that curtain from top to bottom. It opens up the way into the heavenly places, which again in Hebrews 10, 19 said, we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus. There's a confidence or a boldness about going into the heavenly place, approaching God in prayer. But we have that through the blood of Christ. And this is a new and a living way that is open through the curtain. His flesh. Why his flesh? Because he overcame sin in the flesh. He came so that we could overcome sin in the flesh, so that we could stop and be freed from slavery to sin and fear of death. And we draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith because of this high priest our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience, our bodies washed with pure water. This is the working of obedience to the gospel. Jesus is the priest. His blood is that which sprinkles and forgives sins. Our hearts are cleansed in the blood of Jesus, if you will. The body with pure water is a reference to the fact that we are baptized in water for forgiveness of sins. And 1 Peter 3, 20, uh, 21 and 22 make it clear it's not an appeal, or it is an appeal of the conscience for God to God. It's not removal of filth from the flesh. It's not a bath. It's something that God requires us to do for spiritual reasons. It's internal. It's in the heart. And that's how we get that sprinkling clean from an evil conscience. And as he says, let's... Hold fast the confession. Let's draw near and let's hold fast. And that's the invitation of God for everybody in this world. Believing that Jesus is the Christ, is the Son of God, understanding that God has done this. No man could have done this. It's time to admit that God is right. And that I've been wrong. And I need to reconcile with God, and I need to be right with God, and I need God's forgiveness. Why not confess him as the Christ? Why not bring yourself in simple trusting faith as obedience to him, to be saved, and to have this promise that you'll overcome, though Satan may hunt us down. Though we be overpowered, God can bring about the greatest victory and overcome every odd. Don't tell me the odds. People say, well, why not? Because you want to fight hard? I was like, no, because they don't matter. <laughs> the odds don't matter. God is with you. Who can be against you? It doesn't matter. Become a Christian to have that assurance for yourself and, to, and experience for yourself what it is to have a clean conscience, to have boldness to enter the throne room of grace through prayer, to have God fighting for you. There's no better life than a Christian life. Now, there are costs, of course. Anything worth having is worth paying for. But they don't compare to the glory that will be revealed, according to Romans 8. It's true. There's no better investment you can make. You cannot get a better return than heaven. If today you're not a Christian, become a Christian. We have water prepared for you to obey Jesus in baptism. If today you are a Christian, but have not lived right, repent. Come back to your faith in him, which is built through his word. Study again. Open your Bible. Be honest with God and with yourself. Let us pray with you if that is your need. 
Either way, let your need be known in the Spirit by coming to the front while we stand and sing the song selected. 